Hi everybody um, and welcome to the New Wave Takeover of Resilience Collective. Um, we're really excited to have um, some of the BAPJD lot in with us in the technical department. Um, New Waves invites people to contribute, to ask questions and enjoy the session. We're going to have like live making as well as um, digital breakthroughs of InDesign and stuff. So I'm just going to introduce um, the people that are going to be involved and have been involved behind the scenes. Um, today is hosted by myself, Cora James, and produced by Dee Afi, Vicky Thornton, Taha Izzy, Laura Desta, Joe Platt, Joe Burrows, Marta Montana Gomez, and Laura Gagario. And the live stream is by Dee Afi, Adam Radzi, and the AV department, Tommaso Cesario. So um, thank you to everybody who has been involved, and we can't wait to see what we're going to show today. So we're featuring Taha Izzy, um, and he's going to be doing a kind of live bookmaking workshop with you all. And then we're going to go to over to Laura Desta, who's going to share with us um, how to make a catalogue um, on InDesign. And then we're going to go back to Joe Platt, um, who is going to talk about kind of zine making on a digital um, side. So we're going to see both the practical and the digital elements of book and zine making today. Um, but what I wanted to just start with is a live demo from Izzy. Um, so we're going to start with some bookmaking and I'm going to hand over to you, Izzy, if that's okay. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be showing some of my projects that I'm finished and also in the process of working on. But I'm also going to cover the importance of making dummies and different kinds of zines and different kinds of binds. And I'm going to start off with one that is done. This was my final project. And this is it right here. I used, I tried to stay away from a lot of digital stuff. All of this was done by hand. Even some of the printing was all done by hand. And then you can, there's different kinds of paper in here. I used three different kinds. I used just regular print, uh, paper that can go through a printer, about 100 GSM. And then I used very, very light paper using offset litho which is about 60 grams and some are Bible paper, some are different. And the whole decision with going very thin paper was it's almost a double exposure. When you hold it up in light, you can kind of sometimes see the other foot on the other side. But I used that using a flat pen. And then this was how it turns out. And then we printed on both sides. And then when you hold it up, even here, you can kind of somewhat see the other photo on the other side very vaguely. Mm. And then this consisted of photographing my mom and also a camera that I found in a charity shop. And the photos of my mom from this book are a mix of digital and film, but the photos that were printed on the flatbed where from a camera that I got in a charity shop and there was nine photos taken on it. And these two photos are part of those nine photos that were taken on it. And I decided to shoot the rest of the film, but this was in Canada where we're still in lockdown. So there wasn't much to shoot um, except for basically, uh, for example, this photo taken from my friend's balcony. Mm. Um, and then mainly it was actually the tree in my parents' backyard. Or, um, and then from every photo, I wanted to print blue and black and white, but why it's blue and why it's black and white is the film was very old where it started losing its grains. And then all the photos came out in blue. And funny enough, I called the film store who developed my film and I said, hey, you guys messed up my film. It all came <laughs> out in blue. They said, no, actually it's just so old. That it's just lots of color. But I realized all the blue photos were very hard to see, but when you see them in black and white, it's a bit easier to see. So there is, from every photo, there is a black and white version and also a blue version, which was the original. And then here you can see the transition of the film losing its color. Wow. Where's the pinks, the oranges and the reds. And then these photos are from our house, my mother, using different kinds of lenses, using different kinds of cameras that I gathered from charity shops, Facebook market, 
and just being all around. And then the bind for this book is a perfect bound, but when working on it, because I use such a hard and tough material, this is almost like a, it is a velvet. And then I was worried how I'm going to glue the book to the actual hardcover. So I did different kinds of experimenting with how I can get on with it. And working on this book, it was a lot of experimenting. And I realized I couldn't, there was no way of winging it because you just have to practice everything, see result, and then actually do it for the hard one. So I left this overnight, just did a dummy scrap paper. I did a perfect bound and I added the book cloth and I glued the book cloth down on the cloth that I used for the hardcover to see if it would stick because I was worried because of the fibers, this might not glue and this might come off. But then when I came the next morning to see it, it actually glued pretty well. And then that's what I did here because, and then, because it didn't look very well without the book cloth. Originally, I just had it of how a perfect bound would look originally, which is like that. But then that didn't look good. And then when I, when I added a bit of book cloth, it just worked very well. And I really liked how it ended up having that there in the bound. And then everything was put in by hand and cut. And then even the title was um, letter pressed. And then also a lot of experimenting with this because we were worried due to the fibers, the ink might not stick. So, and also just working on this book, I went through a lot, so many dummies. It actually all started with this dummy, which is just simple cardboard. I'm okay. just going to stop you there for, oh, for a second, because can you describe to people what a dummy is? Oh, a dummy people is... people might not necessarily know. Yes, a dummy is just basically an easy version of it. Nothing... So it's something, where the idea starts. It's a scrap, right? yes. Yeah. It's a scrap, you can... And usually when I do a dummy, I don't like to use glue and I don't like to use anything that sticks. I use a lot of tape just so, and then if I don't like anything, I can just take the tape off, move it around if I don't like the sequence. And then it started off with this because I knew I wanted to do a book where was, I had these two projects, but I didn't know how to relate them. I had these photos of my mom and I had these photos from this film camera. And I wanted to tie the two and I didn't want just a simple kind of flip through book. Mm. I wanted two in one. And then my original idea was to have a book where it was from here, you would open it and it would be my mom's photos. And then you flip it and then it would be the photos from that role. But just seeing so many different kinds of books and doing research, I realized I wanted to go with something gatefold, which is what this is called where it opens and closes this way. And then I started off with this dummy, just using a cardboard. I did the gatefold. I saw how it is. I got a feel for it and like hands-on. I realized that was the most important thing with this book. I Seeing stuff on a screen isn't the best, or at least I just had to print everything, just see it, feel for it with my fingers, with my hand, see how it is. And then I started doing a dummy of the inside and how I want my sequence. And then, as I said, I just used tape that even glue them down because I moved, I did so many different edits. Yeah, exactly. There was some where it was, I had the blue and black beside each other so you can see the difference. And then I realized that wouldn't work because when I printed it on this offset litho paper, some were different, they didn't match. So I, for example, this one is a tree and then tree here. So I just wanted to play around with the sequence. I did a lot of different edits. And then after this, my next step was I wanted to do a live true to size hardcover dummy, which is what I did here. This was just done in bookmaking. I didn't really care about the colors, but I also wanted to do very like colors that stand out so I can see where everything is. I stayed away from oh, white so interesting. or anything yeah. just so I can see where my mistakes are and where I had to do a better job because this was a very bad dummy. You can see glue everywhere. I didn't cut yeah. things straight. So I knew where my mistakes were. So when it comes time to do the actual book, I've already done one. So I know how to do a better version of it. Mm. But I did the mistake of doing the hardcover before actually doing my edit. So I didn't know the width of my spine, but this was one part that I kind of winged, but kind of didn't because I knew if I made my spine any smaller, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be able to letterpress 
that way, where uh, when you put it in a shelf, you read it that way rather than reading the letters downwards. So even though from this side, it doesn't close flush, but that's some that's something that comes like I realized with this was the first book I ever make, but now I know. That was what I was going to ask you. Yes. Actually, I was going to say, is this like because you were talking about it and you you feel like you knew the process, yeah. like having to make the dummies, having to work out where you were going to make mistakes. So I was just kind of interested whether this was like not your first time. No, like, this was my first book I ever made, yeah. and then I realized someone else did a similar book, Gatefold, and then his closed complete flush and whatnot. But now <laughs> I know for next time. Is of course, yeah. Through just through, it was a whole learning process. Two months ago, I had no idea what binding is, what perfect bound is, or any of this stuff. But it consisted of so many dummies I had to go through. This was even another dummy I did. And I used scrap paper because it's not, and then I make notes here with pen, pencil, whatnot. This was the dummy, for example, that went on the right side, which I had a lot of trouble with because when you impose or do anything, digitally it will think that the bind is always on this side yeah. so when i had to do the book that opens this way i had to do it all manually where i had to make a dummy with paper and just write down the numbers and then on indesign go and do it all and then just here tape again notes with pen and paper and i always uh, number my pages at the bottom or wherever just so i visually see it on InDesign, just so I know if on here it's 29, on InDesign it's not 29, I've done something wrong, I might have skipped the page, or there's a blank page somewhere where I need to get rid of. So I always make visual references, but they're always by hand because I just work better visually than on a screen. Mm. And then after this project, I decided to do something less complicated and less, because this took a very long time and a lot of experimenting on how I'm going to do this the best way I can. And then I wanted to do something more photo book, kind of have the same feel. And it started off with this, a dummy again. I always start with a dummy. And then this was, I just grabbed paper because I realized with my work, I do like a white border. So I did, I just grabbed a piece of paper, I measured it and I said, all right, I want three millimeter here, three millimeter whereabouts. And then I knew I wanted to letter press again because Funny, I tried to stay away from anything digital. If I can do it by hand, I would prefer to do it by hand. So I just, with a pencil, I'm not good at drawing or anything. So I just write it out, just have that in my head. And then what I do is, is what I've done here is I go on Photoshop and I make um, a contact sheet, two rows, two columns, and I print out all my photos and I group them. If I, let's say this was in Hong Kong from Victoria Peak, if I was in Victoria Peak, I put all the Victoria Peaks here. And then, for example, this was near the bay, put all the bay and then select them all. And then when w doing that process helps you not be repetitive and not have the same photo because they're grouped. And if you see kind of the same photo, same scene, you'll end up picking one because you don't want to pick two, then it's just repetitive. And when you're trying to sequence, is there a certain thing that you think about like when you're I mean, um, for this one, I did because I realized I had daytime, I had nighttime, I had so many different locations. Mm. And then for me, I always think of color. Okay. So for example, the beginning of this book is all daytime and it's all the mix of the blue skies. And then sequencing this book, that was a very thing in my, I had that in mind the whole time is how am I going to transition the colors of the books? And then also one thing I very much enjoyed doing with this was do I leave a gap? Do I not leave a gap? I made mm -hmm. myself notes. And then even if I do it, I print, I don't care. Like I'll print one without a gap. I'll print with a gap and I'll see how it looks physically. And then I'll make my decision. And then I try to, any photo that I don't leave a gap, I want it to feel like it's one long photo. So here I focused on lines where it comes down and it goes back up again. Or if I do landscape photo of like buildings or whatnot, if I can put them together and looks busy, even though you can tell here it's not the same place, but the idea of like the buildings go in one line. And then for pictures that don't go together, I'll leave a gap. But it's also nice just trying different layouts and everything. This is also the second book I made. This is just the dummy. Mm. And then I made the dummy and I knew I wanted to letter press. And then this is where we get to this part where I did this, I letter pressed it, and I knew I just wanted some big text 
wooden blocks from the letterpress. And then I used why it has that kind of glare is, um, is this, it's like powder coating. And after you letterpress it, you powder coat the, the ink while it's still wet before it's dried. I call it the toaster because it looks like a toaster <laughs> and you feed it in and then it's heat. It's a lot of heat and that powder melts onto the ink and then you shake it off and then whatever sticks to the ink sticks and then all the other powder comes off. And there's so many different powders. For example, this gives a shine. I've done invitation cards for a party once where I didn't do the whole letter. So I put a bit of purple, a bit of yellow and you can just play around with so many different things. But working on this uh, book with the title, I actually made a mistake and the mistake is the one I'm gonna go with because while working on this, we printed Hong Kong very big. But then we, we realized this was my mistake. We printed Hong Kong and then we realized it's gonna go like that because you're gonna fold it. But then I realized it would be Kong Hong so you wouldn't read it properly. So, and then I realized the difference between Hong and Kong is only one letter, it's the H and the K. So I flipped them around and I printed Hong Kong on top of each other. So now technically it says Hong Kong here, Hong Kong here. So there's no right or wrong, <laughs> but, and then I've liked that a lot just with the different colors, one in black, one in red on top of each other. And then I realized sometimes it comes to you when you make mistakes. Yeah, like it's I always, always have good, a, right? When you can benefit from the making mistakes. Exactly. And then that happens a lot with anything I do, for example, this was never a gatefold book. This was, I always had an idea of like, I'm going to open it this way and then open it that way. Mm -hmm. But you end up doing something completely different, but that's whole like learning process and everything. And then after I did this, I had to decide what bind I want for the book. And then here it is. And then I just bound this recently. I haven't glued it in so I can show everyone. And then you just, a perfect bound is basically you stack all your photos and then you put it in two between two wooden blocks and you do layers of glue. Mm -hmm. And then you add somewhat cloth is not probably the right term, but it's like this mesh. And then you do five more layers of glue and then you put it and then you glue the hardcover and then you let it leave it in a press overnight again. So it's a lot of process. Sometimes it's, you just have to leave stuff overnight. So you're limited to time. You're like, I'm going to do this. And then I can't work on it anymore because it's sitting in a press mm -hmm. overnight. But even with the in paper, I still wanted to do letterpress. I didn't want, I didn't want to print text because there's no reason to print text when I can do it by hand. So, and then because I wasn't sure if people might not understand or like it would be weird first time seeing it. I know it's Hong Kong, but some people might see it as like, oh, what does that say? So I was like, I'm gonna letterpress a clear title. Okay. And then I realized Hong Kong Taha Izzy were all four letters. So in the beginning, I wanted all four letters boxed in. And then I realized it's, you learn more about text and letterpress, I realized, because you're working with different, you can move a T like a millimeter or whatnot. And I realized you, it's a lot of, I love the technicality of it. And you learn the weights of letters. For example, when I did this all straight, there was too much space between the two Z's and it looked weird because these are all bigger letters, whereas the, the two I's are very small. So there was a lot of space here, which I didn't like. So I went with just centering all the letters lined up. So all of these are in the middle. And then that was what I went with, but that's all with experimenting and going with it. And then also I enjoy using different kinds of paper. I enjoy using old paper um handmade paper because you start getting those yellow edges sometimes for example this is very very old paper and that was just sitting in the print finishing and i decided to use it because in some of the edges you get this yellow aging feel to it which i just love textures colors and did like you think it. that suited this project in particular or you were, you were just experimenting that was just a decision i wanted to go with because this book wasn't a book that i was thinking of for months it was like, yeah, I have a week. I'm going to do a book in a week. So whatever comes my way, I want to be as experimental as possible. That's quite nice, actually, to then kind of flip the script almost like, you know, rather than being like, OK, I have these photos. I want to make a book. It was the other yeah. way around. It was like, I'm going to make a book and then just pick in a week. Yes. And this is what I and I was, we're, for example, this took months. My first project took months to do shooting with my mom, how I'm going to relate to. And then something I learned is like, 
this trip was from two years ago, my Hong Kong. But I always had this idea in my head where it's like, I want these photos in a book somehow, and it's going to come at some point. Yeah. So working on my first book, that was more, it was a deadline, it was for uni. And then this was a book I wanted for myself because this trip meant so much to me. The photos were amazing. The results I got, mm. this whole trip was shot on film and it was still in the beginning and learning process of me first buying a film camera and just realizing the colors you get with film. Yeah. So this was one trip that I just shot the whole thing on film and I was so happy and satisfied with the photos where I didn't want them just to stay on a screen. Yeah. I wanted them, I wanted just to feel it physically, have it in my house or whatnot. It's more for myself, it's not for anyone, but I also did make two copies for <laughs> nice. my friend, oh, sorry, okay. for my friend who I was in Hong Kong with, um, because we were together, he showed me around. So I made a copy for him and a copy for me, which I'll be sending to him. But for example, this is what I was talking about. I put two photos together without a border. Sometimes you can't even tell that these are two photos. It looks like one long landscape, but that is one photo of my friend oh, near the neon light. And that's another photo a bit further of people kind of looking through the lights. And I did the same thing here where it's two photos put together. Okay, yeah. But, and then I really, and then from here, I also did a lot of, I wanted to do the white border. For example, these landscapes, in the beginning, I was like, I'll blow them up to the bleed. But then I realized that's not consistent because the whole book has a white border. And I thought consistency is very important here. Mm. So I made guidelines and rulers in InDesign, which they'll talk about later on. But I just followed the same rulers yeah. and guidelines the whole entire time. And then... Now that you've shown us some of yours, do you want to show And then now I'm going to show something? some other stuff that you can just do at home. Very simple stuff. Um, this is just stuff you can literally do at home. Doesn't take much. I even did this without um, a bookmaking toolkit. I just used whatever I had at home. And I used just pens to poke holes in here. Just a very sharp pen. You can use a knife or whatnot. I actually used a blade just to do an X and then push through the X with a pen. Threads, you can use anything. I actually. This is not wax thread, so I have a candle at home and I just waxed it with a candle, okay. put it through, tied it in the back, nothing too complicated. And then with doing stuff like this, you can also do a collection and then you can just put a little band around it. So if you do two, three, four zines and you do a series and you want to put it all together, you can use one of these or you can use more thread. You can do as you wish. But this is a lot of stuff that you can just do at home, very simple stuff not complicated at all just you're not using no stapler no thread this is just folds there's a very simple one here that i did where you just fold the paper and then you cut in half but not the whole way and then you fold it back and then you push that and then working with this kind of stuff it's always good to um just write make a dummy i my, just for visual reference i like to write back cover front cover page one, page two. And then, so when I go on InDesign, exactly. I know where everything lays down. So when you put it down, you can also know on InDesign because sometimes you'll work on it in design. Then you realize the pages, you have to flip some because it folds. Whereas like, if that's not face, if that's like together like that, when you fold it, you realize one is upside down, one is not. So it's always important. I just like to write down, make a dummy and then move on. But for example, that's one. And then there's, for example, here's another one. This is a book I did. This is a hardcover. And then this was the first, this I did in a workshop. And then I just use it now as a notebook. But from, this was also a good thing because I messed up. This was a, a saddle stitch. And this was the first book that I stitched, but I realized I messed up because I did, I put too many holes, but this was one of the, you can tell here I messed up because it's not the same length. Okay. But mistakes are always really good because now I know where I messed up and I know what to do next time. Whereas if I got it right the first time, then it's like, <laughs> I would much prefer to mess up. So then I know visually, okay, I messed up. Why did I mess up? Yeah. I got the measurements wrong. Go again. But you can still use it. There's nothing wrong with it. Nobody said it's wrong or right at the end of the day. But I've 
only got into this in two months and this is everything that I've yeah, been doing. Yeah, I was going to say that's in, kind of incredible. Um, yeah. Would you like, like to show us as an example, like what you would recommend to start with if someone's making a book, let's say, like by themselves completely by I mean, the there's a lot, time. it's, there's a lot of easy stuff. You can just, for example, this is scrap paper right here. And then the important thing, the only thing I recommend is when you work on InDesign and one just if you're going to do this is literally as simple as it can get is don't forget to impose it because when you fold it you're not going to have you're going to have page one but it's like that that page goes there so yeah. but once you've imposed it you can do a zine at home it doesn't take long 10 minutes grab a stapler staple it there you go that's a little book done it didn't take long at all but because I've done books where I was like, oh yeah. And then I printed it and then I folded it without imposing. And then the whole sequence was wrong. Mm -hmm. So, but it's, it doesn't take long. There's websites online, you upload your PDF, it imposes it for you and then you export it. And that's it, done, go home, staple it. Or you can stitch it, which is what I did here. Uh, sorry, you just like very easy, poke two holes, tie it, doesn't take long. Or perfect bound, if you have this stuff to do it at home, but all of this is very easy. It can be done at home. Nothing too complicated. All self-taught. You can just do DOI. I didn't use a bookmaking kit for any of these. Okay. So all of it was whatever I found at home, whatever scraps I found at uni, just scrap paper and whatnot. But that's my work. That's everything that's that I've been working on the past two months in terms of bookmaking. Lovely. Yeah, I like how varied it is. I think that it's really beneficial to see someone's journey from, like you say, only two months of kind of experimenting and bookmaking yeah. and you've made so like two very very different styles very different one very complicated and yeah. then one very basic yeah exactly and yeah. also that you're showing that you can like make these hand make quite um complicated concertina style yeah just and then also like experimenting with textures you know even doing um velvet yeah the velvet but also even what's that print called again the oh letterpress letter, oh no, not, yeah letterpress offset life though offset life so exactly yeah. so like th those are like not necessarily what you would associate with like, like particular traditional photography yeah books. well that i always try to keep my work as experimental as possible okay. i don't like to follow guides and rules okay um, you don't like so. to follow guides. i was gonna ask <laughs> do my own thing was there a reason why you felt this project in particular like your graduate project right. needed to be a book well it's I didn't think it was right to, to put in any way. If I did want it in exhibition, I would want very big prints and whatnot. But during with everything going on right now, I wanted something now. So I was like, I can make a book because having an okay. exhibition right yeah, now is maybe sense. not possible. But also I, I love books, but I don't enjoy reading. So I, I just enjoy photo books. Okay. So I buy a lot of photo books and I see them and I'm like, anyone can do this. So I was like, I'm going to make one for myself. Okay. And then going with the offset lithos because I just wanted an old feel to it because the photos were taken on film. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to print this on digital. If it's shot on film, yeah. I'm going to keep it hand. I'm going to keep everything kind of that old feel to it. Yeah, that's right. And I think that's a very interesting point, actually, especially with the bookmaking, because obviously, especially for someone who like me, for instance, I shoot only analog. Right. So then when I'm printing in the dark room, I'm like, oh, it's so sad. I can't have that in, in my a book. photo book. Yeah. And then the only thing that you could do is like scan the prints exactly. and then print those in the book. And then that goes that digital because that's a printer yeah, and exactly. then whatnot. Yeah. So it's nice to be able to keep that visceral texture. Yeah, that was very important. Because, for example, that paper, the 60 gram paper I used, you can't feed it through a printer. It's too thin, it's too light. Okay. So if, when I printed the photos of my mom, which were shot digitally in film, I couldn't print those on an offset life of bed, too many colors. Yeah. There's why those are only black and blue because you ink the rollers one color. So you can't have multiple colors, it's one yes. color and you ink yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a lot of there's a lot of experimenting, different kinds of paper, different inks, colors, and then trial and error, lots of dummies, and then until you're happy with the final thing. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. So um, I think we're going to kind of wrap up with you and we're going to head over to Laura. If anyone has any questions for Izzy, we're going to do questions later on with all three of you. So please put those in the Q&A box for me and I'll read them out in a bit. Um, so yeah, we're going to head over to Laura. She's going to share her screen with you all and start talking you through building a catalogue in InDesign. So yeah, over to you, Laura. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Laura Lester and I um, just want to show you the publication that we made for our um, graduate graduate kind of showcase um, collective that we started and um, I'm gonna show you the actual physical book so this is um, 
what we came up with in the end. This is the back. Um, and obviously we had to print like quite a lot of copies, about 300. So we wanted to keep it very simple, very like accessible, just A4. Um, and so I'm kind of um, going to talk to you um, through like the whole process of actually making the publication. Um, first of all, I just wanted to like mention the fact that we obviously had to do a design that was for a, a group show. Um, but like, if you're doing a catalog, I feel like you want to be very um, kind of simple, keep it simple, keep the design very simple, make something that's not like um, too uh, specific. Like that's why we use this kind of like graphic shape, abstract thing. We didn't want to like have to pick one image um, out of everyone's work. And actually how we created this is, um, is actually everyone's, a pic one picture from everyone's project just blended together in a, in a weird shape. Um, and so that's kind of how we, we wanted to do it, um, to just like try and include everyone in the design. Um, so now I'm just gonna share my screen, turn my video off just for the sake of my laptop uh, working. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a bit about um, general like kind of graphic design um, sort of rules. So like some things that you think about when you're first making a book is, for example, the alignment. Um, and this like is graphic design in general. If you're making like some web page, some uh, social media content, like you want to think about the alignment of things. Uh, for example, like alignment to the left is very common. It's very clear, super legible, um, very good for web pages um just because it is like kind of how your eye follows the the sentences um also one thing that you should absolutely think about when you're making a book is to avoid these like little lines that divide and break up the word in two just because um you kind of want to keep it very legible and very clear um i mean again, as I wrote on the presentation, you can make an artistic choice of like keeping them in, but they're usually very annoying to see. Um, so you kind of want to keep your text very, um, very clear. Um, but I think in my opinion, in general for graphic design, the justification, the justified alignment is the best choice. Um, it depends on like the amount of text that you have, but when you have a quite um, like long text, but that's not too long, it's not like an essay long text, then just the justified alignment is more of send the way to go just because it keeps everything very clear, especially if you have images as well. You kind of want it to be like kind of ordered and tidy and justification is the way to do it. Um, also, this is the tracking tool on InDesign that I'm going to show you later. Um, and that's like, Izzy was talking before about the white space in between like words and letters when you like write a text. And the tracking tool is to like adjust that white space so that it's not too much, it's not too little. You don't have to stick with the like kind of standard InDesign thing, but you can um, kind of like adjust it yourself. Um, and then one thing that's kind of very important uh, when you're making a publication is the colors because um, there are different color modes, um, as I'm sure like everyone knows, it's like RGB, so um, red, green and blue and CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow and key or black. Um, and these like color spaces are specific for different things, for example, like RGB um is like way better for um digital things and so like viewing things on a display or a desktop um and cmyk is good for printing so you have to like think about it when you make a, an indesign um file but obviously indesign will kind of 
automatically set the color mode depending on the type of document you choose. I'll show you in a bit, but when you open a new document, you can choose if it's for web or for print. Um, so you kind of have to think about this, but also um, like think about how your colors will turn out on the actual final product. But also when you have black and white images and you want to print them, you have to make sure that you put them in the grayscale color mode. And you can do that easily on, on Photoshop to set your images um on grayscale and obviously when you're making a publication especially if it's uh, a collective thing a group show or just like some catalog to put together loads of different works it could be your works it could be more people um you want like kind of a color palette um and some inspiration for that is obviously like complementary colors are the best thing ever um and obviously it works with the color wheel and everything but um it's just like the easiest kind of combinations uh but also pantone which i'm not sure how you would pronounce in the proper british way um they do color of the year and it's always like a good inspiration their website is very cool so i recommend that as well um now I'm just gonna take you through a bit of InDesign and hopefully you can see, one sec, sorry, okay yeah so InDesign um, you can just start your project, create a new project, um, as I said, you have different like settings. This is print, this is web, and it changes the color mode. And so you can have your A4. Um, we used an A4 for the publication. And you want to make sure that it's facing pages. Um, obviously, you can use like whatever type of um, format you want. Um, and also, you want bleeds because you will um, then go to the print. And so Bleeds are very important. You can have, um, it's usually like three millimeter, millimeter bleeds. And if you're gonna make a book that's being printed, uh, you don't really need the inside bleed just because the pages will be printed. Um, kind of like the insides will be obviously together because they will be bound together. And so you create your PDF, you've got your bleeds. For um, a cover, you would probably need to have a different separate PDF. And so you've got like, for example, something that looks like this um, with your, we had a seven millimeter spine. And so you have your back cover, your front cover, and just your, your spine in the middle. And this is like one single page. So this would be your cover PDF. Oops. But then um, you can obviously just put your cover in um, your general PDF just to like see how it will look like so we can do that kind of very quickly. Um, when you think about like alignment for the covers, um, I feel like it's just great to play around and to be like experimental with what you do. Um, bear with me, this is going to be probably very confusing. So you've got your shape, and since this is like quite a bold kind of like diagonal shape, you kind of want to play around with where you put it. Um, but I feel like just because it is very like striking ready, like as a shape, you don't even really know like what it is. You kind of want to keep um, the text quite simple. So for example, our text was like just our title. it now and we want it to use like three specific fonts just because we didn't want it to be like too confusing so we had just very basic super legible font that's Helvetica um, and we use that for kind of like inside of the book um, like just writings and texts and stuff and then um, just for this kind of like bit just because we want it to be 
whoops. We wanted it to be, um, yeah, as I said, quite experimental, kind of like more than one font, show that it's like varied and not like just one boring thing. Obviously boring is cool. <laughs> we like that as well. But yeah, so we just had like the text here, kind of like overlapping a bit um, with the shape and then just the text up here with the with the names. I'm not gonna do that now. Um, yeah, and so then we had some things that we could play around. Like we had some texts that our um, tutors and some other people wrote for us um, just about the course about um, the whole concept of a kind of resilience, which is um, our, our name, the name of our collective. And we had our logo. And so we could like also play around with that. And one thing, one mistake that I made while making this layout um, is that I really wanted to use this very like punchy blue that looked very nice on um, on desktop on RGB modes, but on CMYK it became like this kind of more muted blue, and that was like definitely something that I had to let go of. Not use my nice punchy blue and just use this kind of um, more muted blue. Uh, so that is definitely why um, I'm putting a lot of emphasis on like actually thinking about your colors and thinking about how you're gonna. Uh, see them when you print them and so we just had like a bit of text and you can kind of play around with it and what I meant when I said that like this is kind of the more the, the justification is the most legible um, it depends obviously how you actually use it. So you want it to be, um, you wouldn't want to keep it like this. You would want to like play around with it until you have a sort of justification that's not too weird, that looks like kind of very legible and very sleek and very simple. And I think white space can be nice to play around with. Like it doesn't have to be, um, whoops, no, this is not working. There we go. Um, like white space doesn't have to be scary. You can play around with, with white space, like even if it's not like all together, um, it can still look good if you don't have too much text and if that doesn't like completely, um, ruin the legibility of what you're actually writing. And so for example, I'm just gonna show you how I worked with um, longer texts. So we had this um, kind of short essay that our tutor wrote for us. Sorry, it's just opening. And so we had, um, she used like the definition of resilience and then um, she had a sort of longer essay thing. And so we wanted to like keep it spread out. You can use guides to see like where you're putting things in the, in the document. This was the definition, the like um, dictionary definition. And again, we had Helvetica as kind of like most legible, simple font. And then we had this other font, which is a bit more bold. We wanted to give like um, more importance to certain things, to certain like aspects of what was written. And so that's also how you do it. You can do it with um, with fonts and like playing around with the different fonts. So like, for example, I would do this and keep it kind of like interesting, I guess. 
and um, you also have to think about like what colors are more legible and like blue is not necessarily a very legible color but if it's like this kind of like inky blue um, it's completely fine on print and so you kind of have to think about that as well and then we had the longer bit of text that was um, just kind of like filling up almost like half of a page, one page. And with that, you would also try and keep in mind like how you can see all the paragraphs in the best way. Cause obviously like this is quite confusing. There's lots of white space here, not a lot here. So you would have to like kind of manually because that's really the best way to do it. Um, kind of like control the white spaces. You would do like this or like this. It's a bit of trial and error cause like you really want it to be curated and legible and so you could also do this and like have the paragraph with the left alignment for the last sentence so it's not like too spread out and so you kind of like play around with all these things until you have like a layout that you you're satisfied with but it's all like trial and error and it's all like kind of understanding how you want things to look in the end and it doesn't have to be like there's no like right and wrong. You can just like do whatever you want, especially for arts um, things. Like it's not a scientific essay or anything. So you can kind of like try and be creative and try and do something that fits the project or the rest of your collective or your brand or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, this is how we would have like made the the text um, obviously is that like it's quite a lengthy process so um, I'm just gonna try and be quick with this but yeah you have to really make sure that you get rid of all these like breaks between the words because you don't want you want it to be understandable you don't want it to be like um, very weird when you're actually reading like Obviously, when you read a book, it's a different thing. But if it's a publication, you want it to be like very curated. Um, and so also one thing about the bleeds, let's get to the actual to the actual layout that we did for um, like each person's project. You we wanted to like have something that was interesting, but also kind of the same for everyone. And so we decided to put like, um, depending on the project, but in general put one, I'm just gonna use my project because I don't think we have enough time to show everyone's. Um, we want it to be kind of like striking. We want it to have like one big image for everyone's project with the title uh, like on the title page and then have all the rest all the other material um, in the second page so that like the first page kind of became the the first thing you see and it would be like the most important image so um, we had like the name and the title again with the different fonts And then we wanted it to be a bit more interesting. And so we put the title kind of like vertical instead of um, horizontal. And obviously you can play around with grids, but I think when you have images specifically, you don't want the text to be like too in your face. And so trying to keep the text kind of in the borders um, was the best choice I think for this specific publication. Um, also when you have the bleeds you have to make sure that your image goes kind of um, to, up to the bleed and not just the page 
because this, like the page mark is where the um, actual page will be cut, but the bleed is kind of like to make sure that you don't have any white borders when you print, because obviously printers are humans and they make mistakes sometimes and actual printing machines make mis mistakes sometimes. So um, yeah, you never really know what's gonna happen. And then we wanted to have like some description of the work um, of everyone's project, just so, whoops, just so like you have a short um, introduction to what you're actually seeing on the page. Again, Helvetica, save on ever. <laughs> and with printing, you kind of have to like think about your, um, the like actual size of your font like I think we use 10 or 9 for the publication because um, you can do test prints and you can have it um, kind of like play around with the size of the font we didn't want it to be too big because that's kind of uh, taken away from the pictures sometimes so we just wanted it to be quite um, like there but not too in your face as I said so it's like you can play around with like the length I think um we tried to be quite like experimental with with the um, placings of the things but if you think about it like this picture you're gonna have to turn the book to see it because it's a landscape image and so it made sense to have the text um like turn the same way so you kind of know that you have to turn the page and that's how you're supposed to see um, like all the material. And then obviously in this page, like for example, you have, um, you can have various different images if you have more material for your project. Um, you kind of have to make sure that in between like an image and the inside of the, your page, you leave at least like seven millimeters because it could be um, cut off from the binding. So you don't want anything to be like cut off. You want it to be completely visible. Um, and also again, when you have bleeds on the sides, you want your, for example, like when you have bleeds here, if you were gonna put like an image um, up to the border of the page, you would want it to go up to the bleed again. So yeah, you can just follow like kind of the borders uh, of InDesign that you can change um, when you first make your document and you can play around with grids and everything. Um, I wanted to keep things like quite spread out because I had like different bits for my projects, different parts of things that I shot and so you can kind of like play around with how you design it. For example, this was another image and then we're gonna have, and like what I really like um, seeing is like symmetrical things and stuff like that. So I would try to like keep everything quite Symmetrical, I don't mind cutting images, um, obviously if that's really important to like not cut things out from an image, then you should respect that um, and try to make it um, as like true to the actual original file as possible. But I really didn't mind. And for me, like on this specific spread, like I just wanted everything to be kind of lined up so that it's like the same size, the same width, and then you can just um, put some text in there, uh, whatever you need to write. Again, I wanted to, I wanted it to be like kind of the same size as everything else. Um, and so I would just kind of like see how it fits in between the images. Again, you think about font size, um, you think about color, justification and then you can just like yes yeah, set up your text how's it how it's supposed to be to be like the most legible I'm not going to do that now but you kind of want it to be like 
maybe have the same distance from one thing to the other. Also make sure you don't put space. And that's it. Um, you can like add pretty much anything you want, but yeah, you can just think about like okay. alignments and things, and then you just explore your file. <laughs> Which for printing is high quality print. What? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Just saying. Can you hear me? That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Sorry. I think we're just slightly running out of time. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I'm but done. that's brilliant. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to go over. So if you could stop sharing your screen, and yeah. Joe's going to start sharing his, and we're going to head over to Joe's section of the new ways, and he's just going to take talk us through zine making. So thank you so much again, Laura. And I'll come back to you with some questions in a bit. Thank you. Good. Okay. Um, my name's Joe Platt, and I'll be going through the ways in which you should uh, sort of check your work for being published or making zines online to be printed at a sort of greater quantity. Um, so on my screen, I have it's my InDesign document of a zine I made um, following my finishing my dissertation. I just wanted to do something uh, sort of of things that I've already had. And I wanted to give sort of friends and family to have a sort of physical copy in a way that's very, uh, I suppose, digitalized at the moment. So I'm nowhere near as creative as the other two. So mine was very much, I'm going to lay it out very sort of simply. I didn't go through a massive amount of sort of preparation and laying all the photos out. I think what I wanted to do was just sort of not not dwell over it and sort of just not not get it out there, but sort of I just wanted to use this as a sort of first attempt and to try and make sure that uh, this was a sort of positive step. So in terms of for online, um, what's quite important is that you, depending on which sort of company or printer you would use, um, they will have their own sort of guides and ways in which you want to sort of set up your uh, InDesign file and your PDF. So what I've used, I used Mixam for mine. Uh, it, I just did mine very simply. Um, and it's important to just double check the information that you require so for example so uh, a bleed just remembering to do a bleed is very important i think that you can often just sort of forget those sort of simple um sort of decisions and what you need to do in order to make sure that you don't sort of mess it up and whilst uh it's perfectly fine to all sort of to make mistakes and whatever. Um, but I'd say when you're, I suppose, paying for it, you want to make sure that it's uh, as good a quality as possible and that you, you go in after getting them printed that, yeah, this is what I wanted. Um, and sort of, it's basically, basically that. So if I show my, it's a PDF. So what mistake I've made before is making sure that the front page is the front page and that the back page is the back page. So um, in terms of how I have laid it out, just sort of very simply. Um, and so for this photo, for example, typically this would have, I think, gone in the middle of the sort of the zine because it's two photos at link. But I felt that I didn't want to stick necessarily to that um, sort of design and way to do it. So I thought I'd put it in a place that it wouldn't necessarily be in. Um, 
And I think it's important that you choose sort of, you can get um, sort of packs from these printers where you, it shows you all the different materials and everything like that. So you can get a grasp of how your images will look in print. And it's what Laura said earlier as to, so something can look very good on, on, a, on screen, but then when you get it printed, it might not be the sort of, the finish might not be what you want or the, uh, the colors don't necessarily come out as they would have online. So it's, there's something to think about in that way. Um, but I, I felt that InDesign itself is very, uh, a very forgiving piece of software in that everything sort of, um, sort of fits, to, fits together. So in terms of how Laura presented it earlier, you have it all sort of, if you want it in the middle, it'll tell you it's in the middle. Um, so I think as I learned just how to do this from a workshop that Cora showed. And I think that in terms of the times we're in at the moment, I found it a very sort of way for me to be as sort of creative as I wanted to without um, sort of going, I suppose, making it myself like Izzy, Izzy has. Uh, and I think it was a good thing to do in that I was able just to show friends and family a project that I'd done ages ago and that they'd probably already seen, but just to sort of present it in a like a physical format was something that I enjoyed the process of doing. And I would recommend people to just try it out and just like experimentation's been said a lot. And I think uh, it is important in terms of getting inspiration from different places or different like different zines or books you've already seen. So I think when you have the chance or you feel like, oh, I've got photographs or text or whatever you like, um, it is a good sort of way in which to produce something that's individual, uh, but also that you can, if you wanted to, create on a sort of higher quantity scale. Uh, so yeah. Um, so I think in terms of when you get it printed, I wouldn't when it when it comes to getting them printed, it's the more you the more you get, the cheaper it gets. So I think you just need to work out how many sort of you you would like. And I think um, it's good to get a a good number of them if you're doing it online, not not necessarily to sell or whatever, or sort of just to give give to friends and family or whatever. So I wanted to keep mine. I just wanted to make mine as cheap as possible, which I think I, which of course you, you can um, uh, experiment and do them more pricey. But I just thought that because it's my first thing that I've made or I've designed that I didn't want it to particularly be uh, over the top is probably not the right word, but I wanted just to show these photos in a sort of simple, more traditional fashion in zines uh, and in zines I'd seen before. So I think that it was what I wanted to do is to get sort of about 30 printed and just see how it goes from there. Um, and I think that's a good a good way to go if you don't necessarily have the time or resources to uh, make your zines by hand, your books by hand, like Izzy shown today. Um, and it's it's not super time consuming either on InDesign as sort of Laura and Izzy have said that um, it, it, it allows you to be 
like creative, even though you may not necessarily be act that, or you might not say you're create you're a creative person. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm a particularly creative person either, even though I'm doing a arts degree. Um, it's a way that I could just sort of experiment if I liked, but know that as a sort of beginner, that I'm using a sort of software that's very easy to use. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a forgiving piece of software. It's, you can follow, there are plenty of guides of how to do it, but I think that once you just know how to do the basics, then everything sort of comes into place and you can do whatever you like with InDesign, make it whatever size you like, whatever. Um, so this is this is A5, but when you, you could do A4, you could do whatever size you'd like. Um, I could have easily split these images. If I want, I could put one there, one there. But I decided I just want to lay it out as I've done on so I just put these photos on Instagram and it's in a very strict uh, sort of squares or just a longer sort of three by three. So that's sort of what I wanted to do, keep it on, keep it online, but have it in a physical form. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much what I did when it came to InDesign and getting them printed online. I haven't gone into super depth but mm -hmm. yeah that's no it. that's amazing thank you um I, what i really liked about seeing all three of what you had to present today was such the very kind of approach to oops, sorry i realized i've still got my mask on <laughs> i'm just gonna take it off so I'm sure. um but i just wanted to um yeah talk about how varied it all was you know from izzy sort of like um not to like but haphazard sort of like very varied textures and different ways of approaching it and then also joe you're thinking about it more sort of like um you keep saying you're not creative but i felt like the way that you dealt with the images was very creative like the pairings of the photographs and the way that you kind of took a very simple approach but thinking mm. about how might that work on a digital platform rather than thinking about like yeah. physically which is really interesting way of thinking about books it's probably especially in the last 16 months that we've just had where we haven't been able to go to physical shows or see physical books that's such an interesting way because probably people were thinking okay how can we make this happen yeah for sure and then laura of course thinking more on the sort of design of a kind of graduate showcase how to display all of the students work and how to kind of give everybody the same kind of equal amount of um i don't know amount of work but um kind of showcase their different talents and stuff it's kind of hard to do in a design so it's really interesting to see how you did that laura for sure i'm just gonna have a quick look and see if there's um any questions and i've got some myself as well um and i also thought that if any of you any of you three had anything that you wanted to say to um each other or ask questions about it because obviously you both joe and izzy you might have you have very different approaches so you might have something that you might want to um discuss as well we've got about about 15 minutes of kind of questions and conversation to kind of round up as well so if anyone does have any questions that would be great um if you want to put them into um the chat so yeah i'm gonna start off with a question um for you izzy um right. obviously you've just finished oh. obviously you've just finished with um making some dummies and we yeah. talked a little bit about um kind of a new obviously made your cover for the most the hong kong project right what do you think you're going to do next because obviously you've tried two very very different book styles have you got I have an idea a, we haven't thought that far ahead no I've, i have a book in mind it's actually inspired by your work mm -hmm. but um i wanted to do a book it's gonna is it's something that i wouldn't do like a book in a week this is okay. something where i have to organize and i have to kind of plan a bit more and um I was thinking of doing, because now I've done my four years of uni, like moving to London. Mm -hmm. I was going to do where like the first day I moved here until like the last day were students, all the photos I took on my phone. Nice. But not like photos of like just random photos, but a selection, like print a lot, do an edit, 
but I wanted to do somewhat of like an A6 pot, like back pocket size little zine where okay. everything's printed, but it's just more of like, there's nothing kind of create. It's not about creative. It's more about like street stuff, like stuff I just see on the street yeah. on my phone or even just stupid stuff. It's a, it's just like, it's your camera roll. It's mm -hmm. something that's very personal, but it's like something that I want to put in something almost the size of a phone. Okay. But it's like not really pictures of people and whatnot, but like I was having a lot of ideas in terms of now that I've learned this bookmaking process, I have so many things in my head. I'm always like, oh, I want to do a book about this and do a book about okay. that. Yeah, so but at the same time, yeah, yeah, like I knew I was like, okay, my Hong Kong one was a priority, but now I have this idea in my head where it's like, I can do a series of most of my travels. And if I can letter press the same way, letter press that, and then just letter press where I've been and then do a book of that. And it would be like yeah. a series of locations all printed, all like experimental and whatnot. Okay, cool. And what about you, Joe? Do you think you'll, do you envision ever printing it physically, that book? Or um, is it always going to stick to, dish, to the digital? I, mean, I do have a physical copy on You have me. a physical copy? Yeah, okay. in my bag. That's but, all right. No, um, no, you don't, it doesn't have to yeah. come out. Yeah, so yeah. I, yeah, I made physical Oh, yeah, you said copies, you made it for your yeah, family. And friends yeah. to buy for like a few, few quid, basically. <laughs> just nice. I didn't want to. Yeah like charge very much. I just want people to see it more than okay. anything. And how did you feel? Did you feel, um, did you feel it was better, still better on the screen or was it nice to see uh, it? Or was it, it, just was, it was nice to see it in, um, in print. I think I, I went for just a sort of standard, sort of slightly glossy, which I think okay. looked quite nice. Um, mm -hmm. But there is a slight like change when you, view it by print rather than online of course I think, yeah yeah I think it's and I think it's really interesting especially what you were talking about before when you said you were thinking about how it's going to look on Instagram or like thinking about it in like a digital so, so it, it's of... like sort of how Instagram's just three by three just very like yeah. that and I just wanted to keep mine very just but that's simple almost, like that. that's almost yeah. kind of like a bit futuristic of you in terms of like how in the last 10 years we've seen kind of social media kind of change especially in the photography world in particular it's changed how everybody makes their work because yeah. they're thinking okay how could this be presented yeah. how like how could i show this online how can i you know the famous like the shot we had earlier of, of izzy talking through all of his um different books that's like a classic kind of flat lay that people use for food photography people yeah. use for all sorts of things so you kind of notice how those sorts of things have to change yeah. all the time yeah. Um, so it's really interesting. Um, I wanted to come to you, Laura, um, if you're still around and ask you a little question about the kind of catalog. Did, Cause obviously the design that I thought was amazing. I've got a physical copy cause you kindly gifted us all the, all one. Um, I was wondering whether you saw yourself kind of going down the design route in a career at all, or whether you still want to, um, or you're going to combine that with your photography. What, what do you think? Can she hear she's us? muted. She's muted. Sorry. That's okay. Hey. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, before doing photography, I studied graphic design for three years. And so that was kind of like the beginning of, um, of my study journey um and i think that just like turned out very handy um with what i do like in general um i think it's good to have more skills and graphic design often goes hand in hand with photography or social media content or that sort of thing and i yeah really it, to be honest even though it's not i'm not like i'm not a pro at it i'm not um a pro at it at all but obviously photography is what i want to do but i think it's all very Kind of like the same kind of world, you know, um, but you can also just like hire a proper graphic designer if you need to make a book or you can try and do it yourself, even if you haven't studied it. It's it's like easy enough to like learn, I think, mm. if you want to. Yeah. And I, I think most of us like are, and Joe, like you're super creative, so don't <laughs> say that you're not like <laughs> I feel like being photographers, we, we kind of have an eye for sequencing and colors and things so absolutely like you should just try it out if you want to make a book yeah 
whilst I'm talking to you, Laura, I wanted to ask what was the one thing, like the one main tip that you learned whilst building the catalogue that you would say to everyone was like the best advice or like the thing that you learned on the job that you thought was like, okay, that's changed the game for me. Um, I feel like best tip while making the catalogue was most definitely like don't don't try and show off you know what I mean just like yeah, keep it simple and keep the work the priority like you have to think about people's works how they interact with each other and how the work is supposed to be seen so it's not really about the design itself you want the design to highlight the photography um, yeah and that was definitely um like main thing that I that you actually need to like bring yourself back a notch and say okay no I'm like getting this is getting out of hand I'm getting ahead of myself you actually need to think about how people want their work to be seen as well of course that's such an important thing to th try and think of and to remember as well and also because you're dealing with a cohort who are very varied in terms of yeah. their practices it's so hard to try and I think you did such a brilliant job of um, kind of curating that so that it all worked kind of really well together and there was no sort of like, it's like when you make your own photo books, you probably found this Izzy, you probably found this Joe. you can't include one one image that's any stronger than any of the others. Yeah, that I mean, that was, yeah. that's the whole editing process. Yeah. That's why I do like, I enjoy the, that's why I find grouping is so important. It's like, mm. it's different laying out your all your photos, but then you also like laying them out. I like to group by either by day by color by scene indoor outdoor it's just a process that i like i follow like in terms of that i like to follow guidelines and rules but with other stuff not but that helps me see my photos better and visualize and not my most important things do not be repetitive okay like don't show the same scene or set twice because yeah. you've already seen it let's move on show something else okay interesting i think that's such a you that's everyone's going to have that unique approach right yes because yeah. for some people repetition might be what they're looking for especially exactly, with a book yeah. it might be like i remember when i was doing a book when i was at university and one of my tutors said okay well you've got three um satellite dishes in this image so you should probably look for something that has three then yes. you pair it yeah, on the yeah. page and then he was like you know those are the sorts of things that you could not you're probably going to be doing anyway instinctively without even yes thinking about i tried it. to do i did that actually in my hong kong book where i had a photo of there's a street sign with five letters and then the photo beside it was five people standing on the street okay, so i yeah. tried to always like if i see something i count or i see the color because some things visually don't look nothing like the, it's a street sign nighttime and there's five dancers on the street and yeah. I was like five, five, I'll put those two together. And I think it's also, it's just what you, what you have to think about, especially with photo books. If you're a fan, like you were saying, I'm sure you, Joe as well, you probably like photo books too, and Laura as well. Um, if you like photo books and you look at them often, you probably go back and re-look at them and you see them yeah. differently each time you go, you know, you get something new from it or you um, take something away that you hadn't quite noticed. Maybe it's to do with sequencing or one particular image. Or I mainly look at sequencing. Because yeah. I'm just like, I have trouble sequencing in terms of landscape and portrait on two spreads beside how do you make them work. Yeah. That's why I tried to do the no gap gap, because if I do two ga no gaps, then it looks like two landscapes beside each other and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But that all comes from seeing other people's work. Okay, cool. Well, I think it's probably time to wrap up. Um, as I aren't any questions as far as I can see um in the q a but yeah i just want to thank everybody i want to thank vicky and Dee and adam for helping us do this um do this live stream today and to izzy and joe for being here and laura online as well and to everyone that came along it was fantastic and lovely to see your work and we hope that you'll check out the graduate rest of the graduate showcase um and the next event is i'm just going to show you guys um yeah is a film screening um and i think we'll kind of show the showcase reel at the end of this so yeah thank you everybody oh i do think i have a question ah so we've got a question from cairo actually um quickly just before we finish where can we purchase the collective's um catalog is there any way that you can purchase it <laughs> you could probably yeah you might be able to get one from the photography department if you ask really nicely cairo so <laughs> Okay, email Vicky Thornton, and then we can see what we can work out. Thank you, though.
Cool. And then, yes, thanks so much. And we hope to see you soon. So, yeah, we're going to play out the showcase now. So it's over to you, Matteo. Thank you. Thank you.